welcome to the Rotary Club of Cincinnati. That was my guest, and uh, I just uh, checked in on Facebook uh, here at the Phoenix, and to um, kind of really address the elephant in the room right away, um, I'm sure all of you have seen or heard the report of the Phoenix explosion uh, by the end of the year, so um, we will be on the book for a new location. Our real estate committee actually met today, and uh, that location is led by Al Compass, and um, we have interviewed all of your ideas, so if you have ideas, please contact Al. Of course, contact the office. Sarah's done already a great job of figuring out um, all of these great alternatives to build this, but in the meantime, continue coming here uh, to the Phoenix. Uh, we're not sure yet what the, our meeting location is. So let's get our meeting kicked off in the right way with our national anthem by New York Metropolitan Opera. Go ahead. By the dawn's early light, what so proud at the twilight's last gleam. Whose stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs were steaming. season, which brings opportunities for sports fans and participants, including baseball, softball, soccer, pickleball, golf, and boating. We are also delighted to experience travel, family reunions, picnics, and so much more. We appreciate all of our blessings. Please help us to actively pursue peace and goodwill wherever we live and work. We will encourage and nurture those who are working for a vibrant region. We members of Rotary International honor our occupations as an opportunity to serve society in an ethical manner. We champion those in our community who invest in their work, seek excellence in their business associates, and develop products and services that represent the fine people of this region. We especially honor those who not only are leaders in their companies, but volunteer their time, expertise, skills, and management insights to nonprofit boards and good works in our communities. Our club's mission statement is providing selfless service in the community and the world through involved and engaged members, service above self. We appreciate receiving our meal today and those who prepared and served it. Amen. Amen. Now, let us repeat the four-way test. 
of the things we think, say, and do. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you. You may be seated, and uh, as you're taking those seats, um, Reminder that our committee meetings today, the Environmental Sustainability Committee, will be meeting right after this uh, this meeting in the President's Room. So take a right when you leave the uh, the steps uh, going down, and then the Hands-On Service Committee is going to be meeting in the Tea Room. So take a left uh, as you uh, exit the stairs. So. Uh, those two committee meetings obviously represent the bulk of, uh, of a, a lot of the work that uh, Rotarians do. Also, I want to remind, if you are a Rotary ambassador, make sure you pick up your yard sign uh, that's gonna go in your yard uh, to advertise uh, Rotary's big community service days on October 26th, 27th, and 28th. If you've not asked a friend or neighbor, to uh, go to the Rotary website and sign up. Um, you should ask them to do that now. So now I welcome our guests and visitors and prospective members. Um, but we want to get engaged in some fabulous Rotary service. Uh, Ariel Miller. Good afternoon, Rotarians and guests. We have several guests today, and they have all been invited by <laughs> our, first guest, our first guest is Nicole Fenya, and she's from the European Chamber of Commerce. We also have Oscar Garcia, and he is a guest of Michael's from Black Hall Direct. Welcome. And from Train Technology, Ruben Ledesma. And we have Joe Litlider is here today. Um, maybe next week. And from MPHR is Tony Pavel. So welcome uh, again all of the uh, guests of Michael Schatzman. Uh, <laughs> uh, when you're a guest of Michael Schatzman, though, you're a guest of all of, of Rotarian, so that, that is for, for sure. One of the other projects that uh, we, uh, we hope Rotarians, you all, will get uh, engaged in um, is uh, something that uh, Steve King has actually been shepherding. Uh, we, um, uh, as you probably know, the Hamilton County Sheriff's Office does not have AEDs in all of its cruisers. And so we are working with the Sheriff's uh, Office as well as Project Hard Restart uh, to raise some money so that they can get uh, AEDs in the remainder of the, of the cruisers. Um, through this partnership, Project Hard Restart has been asked to help with the Damar Hamlin uh, tour that's happening uh, this weekend, Saturday, at the University of Cincinnati. As a part of that, there's an opportunity for Rotarians to learn CPR. So please, if you're interested in that, go to the link in the raise that you received this week um, to start up. If your company might be interested in helping out with this project, um, if your business might be interested in helping support, please see uh, or contact uh, Sarah and uh, the office about participating in that. Um, here at the beginning of the year, beginning of the calendar year, uh, not a whole lot of people were interested in doing a Reds outing, but now there's a lot of interest in, uh, in uh, having a, uh, an outing at the Cincinnati Reds. Um, and so we purchased 60 tickets uh, for the boat deck on uh, September 6th. Um, that includes a, a ballpark buffet, two beer tickets. Um, the cost is $80 per ticket, and they are going to be available on a first come, first serve basis. So. Uh, if you got your phone out, uh, go to DAC DB, make that res reservation. They are, the reservations are being taken on DAC DB, so um, make sure that you uh, do that as soon as possible so that you do not miss out on, um, on those 60 tickets. Um, so our birthdays uh, today um, are uh, two people. 
Pux Miller, his birthday actually today. And then uh, celebrating birthday tomorrow is Melinda Kelly. Today's winner is going to take home 30 bucks, and uh, the rolling pot is up to $450. So, Bob, would you pick one of these? Right. Hopefully, you're not going to pick your own. Yeah. Let's see here. Um, ticket number 3984529. Four, five, two, nine. Where might that number be sitting? Three, nine, eight, four, five, Hux So, so, so close. So, um, one last uh, announcement uh, uh, before uh, I introduce our program. The, um, uh, it's really, really important that you all make your reservations by tomorrow. So you've already received the E-rays about next week's meeting, uh, featuring the Film Commission uh, uh, of Cincinnati founder Doris Owens. Um, so make sure by tomorrow, by the end of the day tomorrow, that you make your reservation on, on DAC TV. So, uh, you know, Cincinnati has some amazing people in it who have founded um, national nonprofits. We've also had some amazing business leaders who have founded amazing national companies. Rare is it um, that a person does both. Um, so our speaker today, founder of the Flying Pig Marathon, founder of uh, Paycor, a powerhouse in the human capital software business. Let's give a warm rotary welcome to our speaker, Bob Kaufman. Ah, great to be here. I just flew in from the Bahamas. Well, it is great to be here. I actually spoke to Rotary only four months ago in Nassau, Bahamas. They, they meet in a, uh, in a yacht club overlooking the water, but you know, it's good. And, uh, Doug asked me to speak today, and uh, I'm happy to. It's a privilege anytime somebody wants to listen to what you might have to say, and I hope there's one thing you can take from today. But that's the, that's the goal, right? Not just to hear me speak. So I don't have, I don't, I'm not selling anything. Um, I tried to reflect and just tell a little of my story and some of the dilemmas and what I'm doing now and hopefully, you know, you take some things from that and we'll, we'll do some Q&A. Um, I titled it today, Making Service and Learning Part of the Journey and Halftime Learning. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, and then I put Bob Coughlin, I put label, label. So. People introduced me when I was introduced at the Rotary down there as a, a, the premier environmentalist of the Bahamas. And I was like, well, I didn't know that. <laughs> I was introduced. Um, but, you know, I, uh, I'm doing so many different things right now that um, the pivot is interesting during my day and, and the things that I'm working on. So um, I think Rotary is a great place to be um, because it overlaps with my personal mission that I'm going to talk about, and you all are making a difference in your community. So it's great to be here. I'd love to, you know, see if there's anything I can do to help any of you. I'm here at the Phoenix, which is where my wedding reception was in 1991. Um, but prior to that, my wife was the first hostess at the Phoenix, Jean, and so I knew Paul Sturkey and you know all the folks who were working there then. Well. We were living in Newport, it was before I started Paycor, and we were engaged, and I picked her up, I used to pick her up at the Milner Hotel that was one block back, and they had uh, beer for a buck fifty. So I'd pick her up at 1.30 in the morning, and uh, we'd have a beer and go back to Newport. But that was, she was here for the grand opening, so talk about, talk about full circle, and then we had our wedding reception. 
So I'm gonna start and, and whip through a few picture slides here mostly and kind of get to the point of things. So uh, this is 1967. It's uh, when we lived in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, some of you may have heard me speak before I showed this picture. So I feel like I'm the privileged one in the middle with a bow tie on. I thought I would be a science guy at some point, go mind a science guy, obviously, but um, my father, um, it, on his lap is my sister Mary, who had cerebral palsy, so really appreciate all the things that you do and have been very involved with Stepping Stones over the years. And my mother and, and my other sister, Patty, at the time was in good health, but it was a couple years after that that she got a scrape on her knee that turned into a staph infection. And, really destroyed her legs and almost killed her, but she survived, but left her disabled. And we actually moved to Cincinnati so she could have multiple surgeries. Um, after multiple surgeries in Connecticut and Maryland, we moved around. My first six years of school, I went to six different schools, primarily moving around to get medical care for, for my sister. And ultimately we landed here in Cincinnati, living in Anderson Township, and all the difficulties that we went through and my parents went through of having that really shaped a lot of the things I think about today and what I focus on. Those things were gifts to me because they make me realize, you know, that I'm in a very fortunate position and um, to help others. So, um, <clears throat> so we moved to Cincinnati. Um, when I was in high school, um, my parents got divorced, all the stress of all that. Um, and I was getting involved with junior achievement. So this is my senior year of high school. I'm the kid in the center right middle, um, glasses on. Behind me is Ali Waddell, who was the first president of First National Bank. Some, some of you folks may know some of those guys in the back row, but I was very involved with junior achievement, a very experiential learning program to learn about business. And I give them credit for where I am today. Um, if you look at that picture, Steve, on the, on, who's on the left, became my chief financial officer uh, at some point along the way. So he went to St. X High School, I went to Anderson, so he's, yes, a lot smarter than me. But it worked out. Uh, when I started the company, so going to where I started paid for, I was 28 years old, I didn't have a lot of money, and people told me, you know, hey, you gotta go out and raise money in certain ways. I just paid off my student loans. They weren't forgiven. I paid them off. Um, but I had I cashed in my 401k plan from when I had worked at ADP, and I was actually had moved on and was selling barcoding systems for a couple of years. And I put the forty thousand. I had fifty thousand dollars. I put forty thousand in. I kept ten, so I could get married and go through all that. Um, I raised a hundred thousand dollars, and then I got a hundred thousand dollar SBA loan. That was the capitalization of the company. We had a 700 square foot office over on Lynn Street, 644 Lynn Street. And I went from making about 100,000 a year to making 28, which that salary soon got cut when we ran out of money. But um, that was all I had. I had no backstop. My father died that year. Uh, my mom died. She ended up um, with a lot of severe mental issues and schizophrenia and homeless at one point. Um, so certainly I have a lot of empathy for what people have to go through when they're put under so much stress. But to tell you, Paycor was a small business. Uh, the first few years, um, which is on the bottom, it took three years to get to a million dollars of revenue. That's the 1.1. And so we had you know five employees and 10 and 15 and 20. But when I started the company, one of the first things I said, I want to be very employee oriented. So we started having a monthly luncheon at the company. And we always carried that on until it became a quarterly event at the casino because that's what we had to have it but really tried to foster employee engagement and then you can see i left the company in 2019 so i retired um, and you can see that the company was growing quite well you know when i when i retired this is what it looked like in 1990 i was very proud of the fact i i think that was a 2000 picture of me but um, those three ladies were there when i retired You saw the headquarters, so, you know, went through that whole process of building a headquarters, really changed, I think, the culture of Paycor. Now, they're primarily work from home, so it's interesting. I was there recently, and it's quite empty and, and weird for me, but uh, I hadn't been in that building for a year until recently. I'm actually 
a very large shareholder, but um, no longer involved with the operations. You know, the business, and I've chosen not to, to kind of give it space and just, and just move, move into the background. But a fun thing was the company went public. You know, I'm sure you guys know that. So I had already left the company. I retired in 2019, and then in 2018, I sold a majority of the company to a group called Apex. Um, I had a lot of outside shareholders, and uh, it was a really good thing for them. Uh, but I stayed in, and I only sold a third of my shares and stayed in quite a bit. So I was board chair for a year, and then decided, uh, sitting in some board meetings, it was best to really retire and let the new team move on. So I went to Apex and said, I'm gonna retire. They go, you can't do that. And I said, well, I assure you I can, and I will. <laughs> and I'm gonna take my brain to other places. And if I have one advice for people who, who say they, they wanna retire, is retire, move on. And um, I don't feel like I'm retired, as you'll hear. But um, one of the fun things about this story, which my wife and I were in the Bahamas. And so this all happens very quickly. You're setting it up. And they gave me a clue that, hey, this might be happening. And I got a call on like a Wednesday, and they said, Bob, this is happening next Tuesday. You need to get to New York. Here's a color palette of what you need to wear. Well, in the Bahamas, I didn't really have any clothes that would be appropriate, nor did my wife. And we had plans, so we were going to cut it pretty short. So we shipped clothes to the hotel that we were going to. My wife got three dresses on Amazon and sent them, and they said, you could be like light blue, orange, or something else, right? And so, of course, most of us are pretty muted, and my wife got the orange dress, Well, she got this, goes, oh my God, nobody's wearing the orange dress, right? She's the one next to me. And then, of course, it worked out, right? All of her friends are like, gee, you rocked it. <laughs> but it was a fun experience. Um, here we were kind of, you know, at the time, so really just a great, a great uh, moment for us. And you can see the stock was $28 a share. It's about 26 Right now, so we can talk about that. Doug asked me, are you happy with the stock performance? That was one of the questions, and we'll do that at the end. And then, of course, they named the stadium, and I'm down in the Bahamas when they do that, too. When I spoke at the Rotary in NASA, they, the, for the Q&A, the first question was, so how's the Bengals offensive line with it? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for you Reds fans, I'm wearing a Reds jacket on the Bengals team. But uh, I would have never spent that kind of money. But the truth is, <laughs> The money um, happened because Pay when Paycor went public, it was hoping to go public at $21 a share. And I thought, well, I hope they get 15 you know, because I know the kind of valuations, I know the business, I know the industry, and I thought it was a high, well, the market was, I guess you would call frothy, right? Well, good for the company because 100% of the IPO money went to the company. None of it went to some shareholders. So what that meant was for the same number of shares, instead of raising, 150 million, they raised 300, almost 250 million. Well, they had some debt they paid off, but the company is looking for ways to put the money to work to help build its brand and its business. The cash isn't an issue, it's a matter of what's the return. So if you really want to know why did Paycor do that, it really comes down to successful IPO and looking for opportunities to really kind of, kind of build its brand. Along the way, going backwards, um, we built a group inside the company called Community Partners. And um, it was really employee driven, but it was really about, we had some guiding principles around helping others in our community. And uh, we got involved with Boiler when we were down in um, Queensgate. So back in the late 90s, one of our employees came to me and she was mentoring a student down there. It led to us basically adopting every class at Boiler and paying for anything we could pay for at this inner city school down on the west side, ultimately creating a high school, creating a, the oil foundation was created by our employees, the Hatmaker Foundation, as they call it. Um, we did fundraisers for Oiler, um, and then that led to adopt a class, which was really Bill Burmichael's program, but he had about 20 or 30 people involved with it. One of my VPs, Rick Shoto, got involved, and uh, he was president of that board for a while, but they have like 6,000 mentors now. So we were there in the very early days of, of adopt a class. And, and uh, pig abilities, which is uh, an app, something that goes within the flying pig, um, is something that our employees created to get behind to help. Because our, the, the flying marath pig marathon is a weekend of events, and one of them, uh, now we had seven or 800 uh, disabled come down and run the pig abilities race this year at noon on Saturday. Saturday, every hour on the hour is a different event, from dogs to 
flying fur to the 5K and the 10K and the diaper dashes, but pickabilities, you know, being one of those races. And here you can see the pictures of our mentors. So the flying pig, um, this is me in 1998. I came and spoke to the Rotary. I told it, it was down at the Hall of Mirrors. I said, there's gonna be a marathon. I was speaking to anybody that would listen. It's a long story and I can't tell today in a short period of time as to why the heck did you do that? As my, if you know Thane Maynard, and I'm on the Zoom board for the last 15 years, one of his favorite phrases, what the heck? You know, and I, everybody said, what, what got into you when you're trying to build a business? Paycor was a $7 million company in 1999, right, compared to where it is today. And I was working hard, and I had little kids, but one thing led to another, and I decided to get involved with starting this thing. And prior to that, pigs were negative in Cincinnati, so it led to a big pig gig, like this, the whole pig thing in Cincinnati, which you know is um, has been quite quite a run, and quite a um, you know quite a great thing to be involved with. Um, and uh, this year, one of the things we did was trying to make a legacy program. Um, here you can see some of the pictures. That's me on the bike up on the right. So I did bike support for five years for the female league. I wanted to see the whole race, so I'm gonna get on a bike and ride with the leaders. And, uh, and that was a lot of fun. And here I am at the start of Pickabilities. Um, down on the right, though, what you'll notice is the Exuma Half Marathon had a booth there. And um, I actually now have a home in Exuma that I'm gonna talk about, which is in the Bahamas. Um, and I'm a resident of the Bahamas, and I'm, a, I'm not a citizen, I'm a resident, but um, involved there. And so they had a thing, and, um, uh, and my wife and I, um, Built the house. But before we get to that, the question of retirement and how do you go about things, it was about 15 years ago that I read this book. It's called Halftime. Some of you probably read it or heard of it, or maybe you've read books that are kind of similar to it. And I was in YPO, I still am, not Y anymore, young presidents, but I'm 61 now. And the premise of the book is really about creating a, a mission statement for yourself and try to give a framework to what you want to do with your life. The guy who wrote the book, Bob Buford, his son had passed away tragically, and he was working like a dog, and he was asking himself, what's it all about, right? What am I doing? Um, so I spent a lot of time on it, actually, thinking about it, and I asked my wife, the O'Form, if I could present to them my mission and the things I wanted to do. And over the last 15 years, it's evolved. So when I retired, it was like, people say, what are you gonna do? I go, I'm already doing it. You know, I, I tried to integrate it into what I was doing, as opposed to make it a beginning and an end. And it was a slow build, but it was always in the foreground and background for me. And every year I presented this, represented it to the group, and it was always evolving, it still is. Um, but at the bottom, if I die tomorrow, what will be your epitaph? Who will come to the funeral? What do I say? You know, that kind of thing. And I have a lot of resources. So it's not about trying to do big things necessarily, it's about trying to do the things that are relevant to you. And there's a, there's a movie called City Slickers where Jack Palance has gone along with Billy Crystal, and Billy Crystal goes out to try to find the meaning of life. And he says to Jack Palance, what's, what's the meaning of life? And Jack Palance says, I figured it out for myself. And he goes, well, what is it? And he goes, that's what you have to figure out for yourself. Yeah. And so, you know, ultimately, you know, I think that's what it's all about. So this is, I wrote this mission statement, you know, that beyond having a healthy family, because I want to make sure that I focus on family first, that my fifth mission is to find impactful ways to help others by using my combination of assets and strengths with a focus on my communities, youth development, and those who genuinely deserve a helping hand. And I might invite and add environmental sustainability to that kind of thing. But I made a list of my communities. And I basically, I watched the movie Yes Man. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie where he says yes and good things happen. And so opposed to starting with no, when people came and asked me for help, I said I'll start with yes. It may lead to a no, it may not be right, it might not be that, but I'm not gonna start with no, I'm gonna start with yes. And I listed my communities, because what I realized is I can't help everybody. So those statements up above are very intentional, really thinking about what are my strengths and how can I help, what are my weaknesses, don't go there, you know, that kind of stuff. And I put some filters and some guiding principles into what I wanted to do. The first one, I prefer Mayberry over Washington, D.C. is one of my favorites. <laughs> because I don't mind just helping a small group of kids. I don't have to solve world hunger. You know, it's really about being able to touch people for me. And that's 
what I thought about is what makes you happy? What's a good day? When you do it, how do you feel? You know? And if you go back to the people who helped me in junior achievement, you know, the mentors that I had back then, you know. Um, and I created a not to do list. And my not to do list, much to my university's uh, stress, is university capital campaigns. Okay? I'm not against them, but what I decided was I was going to divide my life into four seasons going forward. And I'm in season one, I hope, of those four. I put it in five year segments. And in this season, this is, the, this is the list. Next season might be a different list. It doesn't mean it doesn't change. I re-look re at it. But I'm, my goal, and I'm very intentional about this, is give away more than half of my wealth over the next 20 years, both directly and using a variety of charitable tools. I think if I do that, I'll still have a dollar. So back to Azuma. My wife, Jean, always liked, by the way, she's leaving tomorrow for 10 days of wilderness first responder training, woofer training. Um, in the North Carolina, she's staying in a yurt. And um, she's worried about me down in Bahamas, so she wants to make sure we know how to use tools. <laughs> so in 2007, these are my now, I had one still in college, a sophomore at Colorado State. My, my youngest just graduated. I had two at Colorado State. We had no connection there, but my third child went there, the fourth did. She's an environmental science major. She works for Orsanko doing river quality testing all over the, the Ohio River Basin right now. Uh, my kids have turned me into environmentalists, uh, but my kids and family are all doing well. We, we went, my wife didn't like to go to a hotel. She wanted to go somewhere where we were gonna be with kids, play games, and so we went to this place down in Exuma in 2007, and it was great. And then we went other places, so like we went back. But it's in this time zone, it's easy to get to. And in 2015, we went back with a sales reward trip to the Sandals in Exuma. And I told my wife when I got done, this is the only place I go I don't think about work. And that's all I had to say to her. And she sent me as a joke a link to an eco resort that was for sale. I didn't buy it, but that got me moving. And then a couple years later, I bought some land and since I built the house. Um, but along the way, I got involved with the community, and I said, okay, this is now one of my communities. How can I help? And I met this guy, Basil Mintz, who's 93 years old. And he's got a huge family there. You meet one person, you meet them all. But he's an environmentalist, an artist, and he wanted to create a national park. So I said, well, what's that going to take? And he said, well, there's this woman, Catherine Booker, who worked for the Exuma Foundation. They run out of money, and she's leaving, and she's a great environmentalist. So I got involved. Open my big mouth, called the Bahamas National Trust, which is their national park system, met the leader. I said, what's it going to take to hire Catherine to get this thing going? He said, we don't have the money. And I said, what do you do now? Let's figure it out. So this, this national park in the, in the Bahamas is something that my wife, it was already there on the dotted line, but my wife and I are helping to activate right now, which is a lot of fun. And it's small dollars relative to what kind of big, big money is asked for here, I'll just say it that way. Uh, tons of challenges, people dumping in the water, lots of, you know, violating rules. There was just, it was the wild west down there. And so uh, we decided to get involved. We now have a staff of six. We just hired an education officer for the one local high school. We built a uh, greenhouse for the high school and created an agriculture program. We got chickens, bees at our house. It's like, what the heck? Would say. I actually had Thane down, and I said, Thane, can we create a connection with the Cincinnati Zoo? So there's Thane. There's, there's Thane down on the right with Catherine in the front, and that's his daughter, Lillian Maynard, and the white in the background. She's now in charge of conservation outreach at the Cincinnati Zoo, and they're starting to do more outside the zoo. And they just had their first exchange students last week come up. So I realized that there was no structure for giving in the Bahamas, so I created a nonprofit called Friends of Exuma, which is a foreign entity um, for giving. You can see the local uh, grade school there. Actually, I see the Bahamas is one of the places you they pray at every meeting. Right? So you guys said a prayer here. You don't see that as much here, but it's very prevalent. That's me in the enforcement boat down on the left in the green shorts, but um, I'm obviously having a lot of fun with it, too. You know, so it's that. So I had to create a race, right? <laughs> and we had to do a mural. So I, my wife and I paid for the mural that's out for outside the convention center. So it's Dream Big and Fly High Downtown, if you've seen it. And 
and the whole mural program, I'm the biggest supporter of artwork, so I said, let's do a youth murder mural as part of opening the park. So I've stolen all kinds of ideas from here. And there's my wife and I when we met in college, and here we were on a sandbar uh, in Exuma. I won't show you lots of uh, pictures, you know, in Exuma. But it's been a great journey for me, you know, and um, I'm still dreaming big and plump. I don't look at myself as retired, so I'm getting all these awards now. Junior Achievement just gave me a Hall of Fame award. And, um, you know, I was in Junior Achievement, right? So that's kind of cool. And, um, but Hall of Fame and Lifetime Achievement, I feel like I'm in the middle chapter of my book right now. I hope I am. But we'll see. You know, you don't know where life, life's journey is going to take you. Uh, but that's my, that's my talk. Hopefully uh, you took one thing from it. Um, and I love the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. So, you know, I think we're all, you all are making a difference. We're all making a difference. This isn't about, so to speak, right? And I'm still very involved. I just created a charitable foundation here in Cincinnati. I'm very involved in uh, a number of things here, including the marathon, um, but other stuff as well. And I got very involved with Crown Bike Trail. I'm involved with parks. Um, Lots of disabled charities because of my sister. I'm very supportive of Stepping Stones and Camp Allen. My sister went to Camp Allen as, as a kid. I just, they, she lived in a home that's paid for by um, uh, Grace Works out of Dayton. So there's a group. And my sister lived on Madison Avenue. They just sold the house. It's a white house just outside of O'Brienville. She lived there for the last 20 years, which thank God because my parents passed away and having to take care of her, you know, was difficult. Um, because she's pretty severely, she's able to get around, but you know, um, can't read or write or anything like that. And so they came to me and said, there's no elevators here. We need to move these kids. We need some money. And, you know, they, they've got a house, a ranch kind of out in Kenwood for that, for that group. So anything I can do to help that group, I certainly do um, because I kind of feel obviously obligated to do that. So uh, I appreciate you asking me and I'm happy to take any questions. So funny, I don't consider myself an expert on things, but I'm certainly observing. The interesting thing is we just, one of the things we purchased was a mobile conca tree. It's in a trailer. Um, so we're teaching the locals how not to take the small conch. It takes five years for a conch to grow. And I'll get to the heat thing here in a second. But, um, but what the eggs look like and how to bring those back so that we can do things. And we're really... In between the schools and the elders, we did a we did a oral history project with the, some of the elders. It's one of the ways to integrate it in the community, and so we started this mobile conch hatchery. Well, the conch we were we're intaking water. It's sitting next to the water, and what we realized is the water's too warm. Um, it's really warming up. Now, part of that is because it's in the summer in the Bahamas, but um, they said it's the warmest that they've seen in quite a while. I don't know. I don't know the science of what's seasonal and what isn't. But um, certainly, water seems to be warming, right? Are sea levels rising and how fast? I think that's, they are, but it could be s slower than, in my opinion, it's, we're not gonna flood out in five years, but you know, it's a, it's a problem. The thing that I'm trying to do is come up with tangible things. I, um, and please hope I don't offend anybody by my personal opinions here, you know. Um, the whole net zero thing is uh, difficult for me because it's not a real goal. I'm like trying to figure out, okay, we have carbon credits and all these, in the Bahamas right now, is deciding they have blue carbon, which is uh, seagrass, seagrass and, and um, you know, all kinds of things. Well, they weren't gonna develop that land anyway, but what they're doing is selling carbon credits to make money. The, go the go government of the Bahamas doesn't put any of that money into conservation and uh, people are getting all kinds of money in the middle. 
and I, it's, you know, I just would rather see tangible things like, let's just cut the amount of plastic we produce by 50% in the next five years. That's a doable thing. Like every time you open up an iPhone, you're like, how much stuff do we have to package this in? Right? Like, plastic is a bad thing. So how do we, you know, there are lots of more like things that I focus on that are about how do we reduce versus saying how do we tackle global warming? That's that's so hard, you know, to think about, especially when we're here in the United States as a part of the globe, not the whole globe. I think we all need to think about how we play a role, but I think there's some very tangible things we could focus on more, like reducing plastic. When I mean, you see this plastic pile up in the oceans, it's just disgusting. You know, we gotta do something about that. So, um, like a hundred years, if you think about timelines and a hundred years ago and where we are today and where we're gonna be a hundred years from now, you know, we have to be conservationists and practical conservationists so that give people action plans that they can actually do something that's, you know, how I, by the way, the Bahamas has banned plastic bags, plastic straws. You can't go to the grocery store and get a plastic bag. You have to bring your own. So the country did that. Um, small step, very small step. But I don't know if I answered your question, but I'm not. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I always learned from what it says. Yeah. Uh, what's your biggest mistake what you want? Well, none of my mistakes killed me. I start with that. Um, let's see. I think I learned a lot. I, I mean, I kind of learned by doing and making lots of mistakes, right? You know, the, I think, um, and one of the ways that we did that, and I'll try to answer your question because it was so, there's so many, um, was that as a leadership team, we really tried to, we read books together. Every six months, we read a new book and we kicked off our meetings and, and somebody would moderate it from the exec team and we'd ask ourselves questions about what we're doing based on kind of the learnings in the book, how were we doing against those things. And it was all open and honest dialogue, you know, about that, which, you know, led me to, uh, that I think I learned along the way you really can't change people fundamentally, you know, so you gotta work with their strengths and, and their weaknesses. And I think as a, as a younger leader, I thought I could change people, and then you can't. Um, I don't mean you can't change their behavior, but. You know, there's an element of people are hardwired, right? You got to figure out that hardwiring, and we did a lot of work like that. My biggest mistake was probably, um, I don't know, not investing more sooner. You know, listening to a board that was very conservative as we were making money, and we're in a technology business, and really, when we when 2008 hit, 2008 was a bad year, if you all remember. And our, our numbers went a little negative. They, I wasn't hitting the numbers that we set out to hit in the company, you know, because for a lot of different reasons. And my board got very conservative, and I said, no, this is a time when we should be investing. But they were worried about the risk. So I was arm wrestling, you know, with the board a little bit. I could have done a better job of handling the board. So I don't blame them, I blame me. You know, as the leader, I needed to spend more time with them to help them, because they'd show up at the board meeting and just like, puke all over whatever I was, you know, selling. <laughs> but, um, but I think trying, trying to be better at managing a board was never great for me. And the Paycor now is a public company. It's best that I'm not the guy running. It's best that a new team, new team, you know, I got it to 2,200 employees and probably outgrew me in 1,500, you know, so it's, <laughs> So you just mentioned that you and your management team read books. You had a corporate book. Right. What sort of titles or subjects were you read? Was it all right. like uh, management style, Peter Drucker, et cetera, or various? Um, I mean, a lot of them were maybe we read Good to Great and Built to Last and Flight of the Buffalo and, you know, some of them were behavioral books um, type things like about management and, and leadership. Um, we, we would read about 60 pages a month, so whatever that pace was, and sometimes skip a month because we were busy doing other things, but that was the goal, and there would be a sheet of free questions, and our exec meetings would start at 7.30 in the first hour was book discussion. And, and, and it kind of set the tone for an open dialogue for maybe what was a whole morning meeting. Um, but we, um, trying to think, we read books about business startups, we read technology books, we read, um, I, I, could, I could give you the book list. They're, they're actually on my shelf, and I'm just blanking now. Um, 
Well, one of them I, that we read was called The Dreamcatcher, which I, I often, I, I quoted when I got this award recently, and that what I took from it was two things, and that is that there's only two things that motivate people, and if you destroy either one, you destroy motivation. And I would say as a leader, I walked around with this in my head every day when I greeted people, and it was that people need to believe that tomorrow can be better than today, and they need to believe they have a saying. That's it. And if you, but what you have to think about is the belief. Like, do they really believe? And whether they have a say in it also has to do with how you treat them in the elevator and how you let them know that they're important. So if your employees know that tomorrow can be better than today, they believe in the plan, and they know that they're, they're important to it, that's all you need to do. And they'll, and they'll find their way to the other side of it. So I thought about that as I grew the company and communicated and, and greeted people. Whatever I was doing, I was like, okay, that's the belief was the big thing. Though. Do they believe the plan, or are they just listening to what you're showing and shaking their head? You know, that's the thing, right? <laughs> Go ahead. How we doing on time? Go ahead. I don't, I don't know names, so you're gonna have to help me. When you started, you were a young man, obviously. What did that? And now? <laughs> <laughs> Well, obviously, you know, unfortunate how it worked out, but um, my goal was, when I started it, to create, you know, a good income for myself, a business that um, was relevant to employees and to the community and to our customers, and, you know, um, build it to a certain amount of relevancy. I, didn't, I had spreadsheets and goals on Very Numeric, and, you know, I was using Lotus 123 back then to create spreadsheets of how I got to, our average customer was paying us $90 a month. And one of the tough things about running a repetitive revenue business is that you could go out and sell a lot of customers, and then they start, and then they pay you $90. So you can, they might pay you $1,000 for the year, but they're paying you $90 a month. Well, that's great once you get to be big. When you're small, um, you know, it's, it's not so great. So I was, I was running checks to the bank. I was, but the, the vision back then was, I wanted to at year five, and so I had those original shareholders, and they were friends and family of mine, and I wanted to own the whole business is what I thought when I started. Like, I wanted to get, make sure, I had control of it, but I wanted to buy them back. So the plan was, you buy these shares, and it were $5,000 shares, or $500 shares were $5,000 minimum, and I, I have the right to buy you back. I had a calm at four, five, and six times what they invest in year four, five, and six. Because people said, well, they want five times their money in five years. So 30% annual return or something like that. So I said, okay, here's the plan. And they were friends. And they were like, great, if you can pay me that, great. So after year four, I couldn't buy them all out, but I went out to the shareholders and I asked for any volunteers, and two of them were bought out. One of them, is, it was a father of one of my other shareholders, and he donated the shares to the free store, and then I bought them out of the free store. It was $20,000, right? Um, the next year, I bought out a couple more. It turns out when the company went public, I had five of the nine original shareholders never took a dollar in 29 years. So I had one of those guys who put in, well, it was actually 10 shareholders, but one guy called me, so I had sold $95,000 worth of the stock. This guy calls me and he says, he says, dude, so he's a friend of mine, dude, I hear you're starting a company and he used to work for me. And I said, yes, his name was Joe. Yes, Joe. And he says, dude, I just sold my Ninja, which is a motorcycle apparently. And he said, I got 2,500, but my buddy, the Duffer, has another 2,500. Could we be the last shareholder? And I said, no, it's 5,000, Joe, so I'm not on. I called him back a couple days later, I, and I said, look, Joe, I'll, I'll let you guys do that, but I don't want to deal with the Duffer. I'm just dealing with you. I don't know the Duffer. So he says, okay, deal. So he put the money in. After four years, Duffer took the 10, okay? After, um, so when the company, when I, I sold the majority of the company to Apex for quite a bit of money in 20, 2018, then I stayed on for another year uh, that I was chairman. So I called Joe and I said, I need your wiring information. He goes, what are you doing? I said, I'm selling a third of my shares. I'm going to keep two thirds in it. 
He said, okay, that's what I'm gonna do. What's it worth? And I go, why don't I not tell you that? <laughs> why don't you just give me your bank account number? Oh my gosh. And you call me when you get the wire. Right? So I have it on my phone. I play it. I, pl I, 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 I will always stay his voicemail. It turned out it was a million and seventy-eight thousand dollars for a third of his twenty-five hundred dollar investment. Wow. <laughs> and, and since the company went public, the other two million is now worth eight. Right. So um, whenever I need to raise money for something, I just call. Them, you know. <laughs> They still meet, have meetings there. They've reduced, they've downsized a lot of their extra office space to put everything in that building because we got to where we had half the buildings around Norwood that we had people in. So I think they're, they, they've more or less pulled back. Regarding the offensive line, though, okay, I, I am a fan of the Bengals in the 80s. Like that was a fun time. The Bengals, the Browns, if you were around the Anthony Munoz and Max Montoya and Boomer Esiason and Kenny Anderson and Collinsworth and Icky Woods and the whole thing. And I always said to people that the end of that era was when they got rid of Max Montoya. And then, and then, uh, and then uh, Munoz ends up retiring. You could have put anybody behind that offensive line. I mean, James Brooks ran circles around people. But if you want to be successful, and I'm glad the Bengals have really invested again. It, it, it was unfortunate that those guys got hurt at the end of last year, but they because they had really gotten it together. That's where you win the game. That's what I think. <laughs> awesome. Uh, so, uh, Bob, uh, I, I love all, a lot of what you said. The, uh, one of the things you said was your yes. Uh, and um, maybe you probably use these, but this is the rotary four-way test that you heard us. So probably. Uh, four-way test as you uh, as you say yes to people uh, before you either say yes again or, or you get to know that this uh, coin that we're giving you has the four-way test as well as the Cincinnati skyline that I know you love. Uh, we're also making a donation to, in your name, to the End Polio Math Campaign that the International is, uh, is working on. But thank you again. Um, uh, you know, the uh, Rotary motto this year is create hope in the world. I know that you do that every single day. I know that you're helping all of us do that. Um, thanks for being here. Have a great day. <laughs>